Well, hello. Welcome, everyone. I think we can start to see some people coming through. Um, this is our inaugural fireside chat um, as hosted by Syed Business School. We're going to allow you all just a minute or two to come on in. And um, you'll see up on screen not only our speakers, you'll see our alums who kindly put this through together. And we really do hope you have a wonderful event. Uh, but before I hand over, we're just going to give you another minute or two to log on. I can see the numbers coming through now. So welcome. Thank you to those that are joining us. Our numbers are still coming through. You didn't hear me speak a moment ago. We're just going to give you a minute or two to have the chance to log on before we hand over to the team. Welcome to our webinar, Oxford Impact Investment Collaborative, coming together to host our first fireside chat event. I can see some familiar names logging in. This is fantastic. I recognize some of you, welcome. One more minute. Okay, well, without further ado, we don't want to eat up too much time. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this event. And I will hand over to kick this event off to Richard, if you don't mind. So thank you, Richard. And off you go. Thank you, Leila. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, greetings to our esteemed guest speaker, faculty, uh, fellow alumni, and current students at Oxford State. Today, we have all gathered from all over the globe for the inaugural Oxford Impact Investment Collaborative virtual session. As we all know, the world faces many challenges, environmental and social among them. Today, according to GIN, over 715 billion in assets under management target impact investments and over 35 trillion in assets target ESG. Allocating these vast resources effectively is of utmost importance to all stakeholders. With this in mind, building on the foundation provided by the SAID Impact Executive Programs at Oxford SAID, a group of alumni came together to continue the thought-provoking conversation started during the class and bridge the gap between impact investors and impact investees. We aim to demystify and promote impact investment principles as a developing field globally through candid and stimulating dialogue between experts and rising talent. We collaborate and support one another to increase impact investment in our jurisdictions and organizations. We represent private and institutional investors, startups and large investees, family foundations and academia. As part of our effort, we are excited to announce monthly virtual fireside sessions with distinguished members of the global impact community. Special thanks to my co-founders, Juliana Hess and Carmia Lerman Norton for being the driving force in OIC's establishment. Together, we would like to also thank Oxford SAID for giving us this opportunity and support. In particular, we'd like to send a big thanks to Kareem Harji, Program Director at Oxford Impact Measurement Program, and Leila Valterio, Business Development Manager at Oxford SAID, and also Lara Mould, Marketing Manager at SAID. Finally, we'd like to thank all of you, our corpus, for being here. This is just the first event. We have much more in store and we'll keep a variety of format speakers and continually make improvements to make OIC 
as useful to all as possible. Today, we have a terrific speaker and who Juliana will now introduce. Over to you, Juliana. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that all the views expressed here are our own and not those of our respective organizations or the university. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today, kicking off our first fireside chat. We're excited to create this multidisciplinary, multicultural collaborative to foster cooperation amongst us practitioners in the international impact space, allowing us to ask tough questions and find solutions to challenges together. I too want to thank my co-founders, Richard and Carmia, our classmates, some of whom join us here today at the virtual table and the university for their incredible support. We're honored to welcome impact sector trailblazer, Johanna Kellerman. Johanna is currently the independent chair of Pension Fund Zorgen Belzine, the pension fund for the care and welfare sectors of the Netherlands with 254 billion euros of assets under management. Under her leadership, PFZW has pledged to invest 20% of its portfolio in impact and sustainability investments over the next five years. Ioana is also the chair of the supervisory board of Aflatoon, an extraordinary international NGO that provides financial and life skills education to 10 million children in over 100 countries. Ioana, welcome and thank you for being here. It's hard to do justice to the incredible personal and professional path I know you've walked to get to where you are today. International lawyer, central banker, supervisor, benefactor, and mentor. You have extensive experience in the private, public, academic, and philanthropic sectors. You have sought to go above and beyond to create cultures of inclusiveness and impactful environments wherever you've gone. We welcome you here today to help us understand the evolution of impact investment, to share best practices, tell us about the challenges you've encountered on the road to today, the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead, and to help us to get us to think of ways to collaborate and make an impact. We're also curious about your career and how you and PFWZ have managed to such an incredible feat. So we can't think of a better person to help us kick off this fireside chat. I give you the floor. You're muted. Wow, Juliana, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I, uh, I'm here because of you, as you, as, uh, as you may know, Juliana and I met, um, I, I, it must have been, I don't know, more than 25 years ago. But if you've met Juliana, you all know that it's impossible uh, to forget her. And uh, of course, for a Dutch woman, it's hard to resist, uh, you know, an American woman bearing the name of our former queen. So uh, I'm really thrilled to be uh, back in the room with you, Juliana. Um, and I'm also very honored to, uh, to be a part of this, uh, uh, of this launch uh, of these Fireside uh, Chat uh, series. So I'm really excited. And also, I'm very excited about what you all are doing uh, on, um, you know, in, in terms of um, becoming the world's first and leading experts on impact investing. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's knowledge that we that we really, really need uh, today. So I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to an exchange with all of you. Juliana, would you like me to, to kick off and, uh, and, and um, talk a little bit and then we, we take it from there? Absolutely, yes, please. Okay, great. Um, well, you've asked me to first tell you a little bit about my career, my background, uh, and, and what I'll try to do is include um, the, the journey I've uh, traveled uh, um, uh, as well from, uh, from what I call from abstract to impact over the years. So I was trained as a lawyer at Leiden University and I started my life in one of the big law firms in the Netherlands, which is actually when I met Juliana. Um, and um, I was a partner in that law firm for, uh, for 12 years. Um, and uh, as part of the work in, the, in, in, uh, in that area, I um, spent uh, four years in London with my family, uh, leading the London office of, um, of Nauta Dutil. 
At the time, I specialized in finance and in particular international financial transactions and more in particular complex financial transactions, uh, such as securitizations and setting up of CDOs and CDOs of CDOs, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at a certain point, I, um, I realized that um, this was not something I wanted to do all my life. Um, and um, just at, uh, as I was realizing that I sort of come to the end of, um, you know, specialization and, and abstract uh, transactions, I was approached upon my return to the Netherlands to become the general counsel of the Dutch Central Bank. And so I changed to the public sector and I became the general counsel of the Central Bank. And then uh, two years later, I was asked to join the board of the Central Bank and become the director of supervision for the pensions and insurance industry and for the uh, integrity supervision. And uh, as my children always say, that was the exact moment that the financial crisis hit. Uh, in the meantime, I've, uh, they've all studied economics, so I hope that by now they know the difference between uh, correlation and coincidence. But um, this, is, uh, this is still, uh, of course, uh, both personally and professionally, uh, this was a very, very impactful time. Uh, and I think it changed many people's perspective. It certainly did change my perspective. So for um, the term I spent at the central bank, seven years, most of it was crisis management, after crisis management, and then restructuring and finding new ways for the financial sector and for financial supervision to move forward. Um, and around that time, one of the things I did was um, to analyze what had really gone wrong uh, in, during the crisis. And, we actually came to the conclusion that it was not so much uh, a financial um, set of mistakes that uh, set off the downfall of uh, so many of these financial institutions and uh, almost of the financial system as such, but that it was rather the conduct, the behavior of people uh, within those firms that was at the heart of the problem. Uh, and we devised a, uh, a methodology that has been refined and developed since for supervision of contact, conduct sorry, in financial firms. And that uh, methodology has, uh, you know, has sort of spread. It's now also used by the European uh, Central Bank in its supervision of banks and also uh, by the Bank of England. Um, anyhow, um, I uh, uh, left the uh, Dutch Central Bank at the end of my first uh, seven-year term in order to become uh, a director at the Single Resolution Board, which is the supervisor uh, authority in, uh, in the European space, in the Eurozone, uh, that was set up after the financial crisis in order to make sure that in the future, banks would not have to be saved with taxpayers' money but with money that they have been saving themselves. And now the Single Resolution Board has put together a fund be, uh, funded by contributions from banks. That fund is almost 50 billion at the moment. And banks are now uh, bound to have plans for um, if things go, go wrong. I spent three years in Brussels and then um, I came back. I had a cooling off period and that was a, a very intense period of uh, thought and rethinking what uh, what I would be doing with um, the rest of my professional life. And um, during that period, I decided that I would try and focus on the two things that I felt most passionate about. Um, one is sustainable finance and the other is the open and democratic society. Uh, and that is actually reflected in the things I do now. I, I as, it, as, it, uh, as it's called, I went plural. I now have a portfolio of non-executive roles, uh, whereby I'm chairing the um, Utrecht University Supervisory Board. Juliana also mentioned that I'm chairing a, uh, an NGO that does social and financial education for kids worldwide. Um, I also um, am on uh, the member of the supervisory board of um, the uh, NWB Bank. The NWB Bank is a bank for and by the water boards in the Netherlands. 
It's a promotional bank that has a triple A rating uh, and that has also a mission to, uh, to do purely sustainable finance in the public space in the Netherlands. Um, and as uh, was mentioned, um, my main role at the moment is that I'm the independent um, chair of the board of PFZW, sorry for the name, uh, also in Dutch it's a horrible name to pronounce, um, but it's the pension fund for the uh, uh, healthcare and welfare sector workers in the Netherlands with some 3 million um, members. Um, well, as you can see from the development of, of my career, I've, I've, I've told you a little bit about that. Um, I've, I've been, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I had my doubts about the financial sector uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, I think those doubts were confirmed uh, during the financial crisis. I spend a lot of time trying to fix it and make the financial system better, more resilient. Uh, and also um, I did a lot of work on the integrity of the financial system and the actors within the financial system. And uh, before I left, I remember very vividly that um, we identified as a problem that many of the um, uh, actors in the financial sector had lost the uh, trust of the public. Um, banks, of course, nobody trusted banks anymore, insurance companies, but in the Netherlands also people didn't trust uh, pension funds anymore, which was actually quite remarkable. Uh, and I remember um, uh, speaking to, uh, to, the, to the pension fund sector in 2010, telling them, I think there's only one way you can regain that trust, and that is by showing what you're investing in, showing the people that you're investing in things that are good for them, that are actually helping them, uh, and, and telling them about it. Well, at the time, I, uh, I got a lot of criticism for that, a lot of flack. Uh, this was not what the supervisor was supposed to do, and investing was, you know, their business, and investing was purely for, um, uh, for, uh, for revenue and, and financial uh, rewards and nothing else. That has changed. Uh, and to give you a little idea of the pension sector in the Netherlands, uh, uh, that will probably clarify why I spend so much time on it. Uh, in Holland, we have uh, a publicly funded uh, basic pension for everybody who is over 67. Uh, but that's a very basic income. But for the entire population that uh, is employed, we have a second pillar of pensions that is uh, collected and uh, taken care of by um, uh, the, uh, uh, both the, uh, the, the unions as well as the employers' organizations. And it's organized by either by company or by industry. And so um, we have some very, very large pension funds. We are the second largest, this one that's double our size, which is for the public sector. And um, uh, so uh, education uh, and, uh, and civil servants uh, that has a, um, um, 5 million plus members and uh, 500 billion plus uh, in assets. Uh, our fund is the second largest. These big funds and also the smaller ones have over the years uh, become, be, be become more and more into um, sustainable investing. Um, and as a matter of fact, the fund I chair uh, has been uh, top of the list uh, sustainable investor for, for almost 10 years, until two years ago. Then we lost our first place. And then we discussed whether that was a bad thing or a good thing. And we actually decided that was, it was maybe not such an incredibly bad thing. It, yes, it did mean that we had to step up our game, but it also meant that sustainable investing has become much more mainstream uh, in at least the Dutch uh, pension sector, which is important because it's, we're talking such huge amounts. Um, for instance, the Dutch pensions industry for years was the third largest investor incoming investments into the US worldwide. 
So, um, you know, when there is a movement there and, and when, when that kind of money is moving towards sustainable investing, that, that actually means something. And I think, well, you are much more experts than I am, but I do think you actually see that, that something's happening, things are shifting, something's moving. Um, I, um, I would like, I, I, I think it's better not for me to talk, uh, to, to, to go on and on. Uh, and I, I think it's better to, to have an uh, interactive session as much as we can. So let me stop by uh, saying a few words about how we came to our current investment policy and what we see as the main challenges and dilemmas. Um, like I said, uh, PSW has been top of the list for, for many, many years. So sustainable investing has for a long time been on the agenda. Um, still, um, we have just made our new strategic uh, sustainable investment plan uh, with some pretty ambitious goals. I think the most visible or the most challenging perhaps of those is that by 2025, we want to have 20% of our assets, all assets, uh, into impact investment um, geared towards um, uh, seven sustainable investment goals that we've selected out of the 17 uh, around two main themes. The, the one main theme is climate and the other main theme is people and health, which is of course something that makes sense for a healthcare fund. Um, that was an interesting process and a long process, very intense, involving the board members. I chair a board of 12 people, uh, six of whom are employee uh, representatives and seven and six of whom are uh, employers representatives. I'm the independent chair. Um, and um, uh, it took us quite a while to discuss um, uh, the, um, uh, this new policy and what, 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 were the, what were the main points of discussion? Well, as you can imagine, there's still that question of, um, uh, is there a trade-off between, uh, between impact and, um, uh, uh, uh revenues? Um, but, uh, another important point for discussion, and that is one of the dilemmas I still see is, we have uh, for the past 15 years become a passive investor. So we invest in index funds, many of whom we select ourselves. So uh, we also have green indexes uh, in, in which we invest, but still we remain a passive uh, investor, uh, which was a very conscious decision uh, because we want to be a low cost pension fund for our uh, members. Um, Still, the question arises whether that is a, uh, a strategy that we can maintain if we really want to move towards becoming uh, uh, not just a sustainable investor, but also an impact investor. So that's one dilemma that we discussed at length. Um, another dilemma that we may come across when we talk uh, uh, later is, um, of course, how do we measure impact? So we say we want to have 20% of our portfolio into impact investments. Okay, so what is impact? How do we measure that? How do we go about that? How do we make it comparable, etc.? cetera? Um, and one of the things we did to address that question is that we uh, started with uh, a few other large institutional investors all over the world, the SDI Asset Owner Platform, where we try to, um, to, to come to, to common standards. Um, third big dilemma is, of course, do we engage or do we leave? Um, at the moment, uh, there is, of course, a very uh, uh, a strong discussion in the Netherlands, no doubt uh, in your countries too, uh, in the run-up towards um, the, uh, the Glasgow conference. Uh, many, many uh, um, activists and uh, groups are putting the pressure up on us uh, to go uh, zero percent uh, uh, CO2 uh, uh, policy. They want us to become fossil free. Uh, 
And the question is, we have said that, is, that we've made a conscious decision not to go fossil free, but to engage and to use our power and our powers of persuasion and our money um, to, first of all, select the, uh, the leaders in the industry and, uh, and not to sell our portfolio. Um, and then the fourth dilemma that we might, uh, that we come across, and that I'm also interested in your views upon, uh, when it comes to impact, one of the dilemmas is, do we buy impact or do we make impact? So do we buy into existing companies and just buy shares or finance them? Or do we make um, projects possible that, that have an impact and that otherwise would not be possible? Um, so I'm just you know, putting them on the table uh, and I think we'll have a lot to discuss. Thank you. Back to you, Juliana. Um, thank you, Joanna. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, I'm going to open up the table to my classmates to get us started. So if uh, Anna, Kansu, or Ritush uh, would care to jump in, and we will also start answering questions that come in from, uh, from the audience. Sure. Thanks, Juliana. I can go first. Hi, everyone. This is John Su. I'm a senior partner at Bethnal Green Ventures. Europe's leading early stage tech, tech for good VC. And I guess, uh, thank you so much, Iona, uh, for, for uh, setting setting stage. And uh, I my mind instantly, obviously as, an, as a venture capitalist, um, I, I feel, particularly as an early stage venture capitalist, I feel like uh, what we do at BGV sits at the very top of the impact funnel and the innovation funnel. So I was reflecting on what you just said as your late last dilemma, do we buy impact or do we make impact? And I feel like that also links with the questions that we've discussed internally briefly, the question of intentionality as well. What do we help existing incumbents become more green or do we actually um, help build new, new technologies or new approaches so that we that we help encourage the massive mindset that's going on. So um, my, I guess what I really want to say there is essentially, I feel, I feel like it's really important to have everyone at the table while we're talking about, particularly talking about climate crisis and how we can help that tree impact investing. And in that sense, I feel like there, is not, there isn't a real choice between whether we help you know, the big ones uh, become more impactful through financing them or whether we help the small ones uh, with their really innovative seed, seeds of thoughts and then help them become the incomes of tomorrow. So I guess that's what I want to jump in with at this stage. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Joanne, sorry. No, sorry, I, go ahead. I, no, I was, I, I'll give you the floor, I'll give you the floor. Well, I think you, you, you're really on point. I mean, uh, this is uh, um, this is yeah, this is this is one of the big questions, and um, I think uh, uh, one of the reasons um, we we are having this talk is that um, it's not so easy. Uh, there's uh, apart from the dilemmas I mentioned, even if we as an institutional investor would uh, would decide would would settle on okay, we want to make impact. We do, we do not we do not just want to buy into it. Um, that's complicated, uh, you know. And uh, uh, one of the things I think where there's still a lot of work to do is to 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 really bring together. Uh, let's say the, uh, the the actual people that are making an impact and the institutional investors, and to try and bridge that gap to to make it investable. Um, when when for instance, when you look at the SDGs, uh, we've uh, you know we've done the exercise of actually calculating um, you know which ones we're we're most invested in and and which ones are easy to invest in and which ones are not, and there's big differences. Um, even though all those goals are, you know, equally important. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's something we see reflecting in our portfolio as well. And obviously, you know, our, our, our V1, at least our focus on investment is wildly different to your focus and on a much smaller scale. 
but what we found found is essentially there are certain SDGs that are almost like the uh, b building blocks for other ones to really work. And there is one that really strikes to me within the context of this brief discussion is the one around I can I don't I can't remember the which number, but it's the one around partnerships. Uh, where it's easier, you know, it's hard to invest in that, but I think it's easier to foster that through collaboration and also making sure that there are structures where uh, different parties can come together. And that also in itself requires investment of a different kind. Absolutely. Anna, would you like to? Uh... Yes, yes. Thank you, Juliana. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a lawyer actually in Brazil. So I'm really happy to have you here. Yuan, and thank you, Richard, Carmen, and Juliana for getting all this together. So I'm super happy to hear from you that you, as a lawyer, um, make this um, change in your career and is now working with uh, and being is involved with impact investment. Uh, first thing is like, I, I agree with all uh, with what you, you said about intentionality. This is something that is tricky in impact investment in, and also something that we discussed a lot in our classes. But also I think that um, I would like to hear from you how you're planning to cope like um, impact and ESG because I also think that uh, it's not enough to, to have like an impact or build an asset or portfolio um, directed to impact investment, but also, how is going to this impact is going to be reached? So um, I think that ESG plays also a big role here, and I would like to hear from you whether you're looking at a specific um, uh, metrics or um, specific agenda, where uh, how this is going to be uh, monitor monitored or follow up with the investees. So in your portfolio. Yeah, in our portfolio, thank you, Anna, for, for your question. Um, in our portfolio, what we did is uh, we have, of course, an existing portfolio. Uh, and um, what we agreed is that we want to, um, to sort of sift through that portfolio based on certain minimum standards. Uh, and what we've uh, chosen as our minimum standards is the OECD guidelines. Uh, that we want to apply to all investments. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, as you can hear, I'm, I'm formulating a bit cautious because we are in that process, but we haven't done it all. And it's difficult, because, uh, precise, and it's even more difficult because we're this passive investor. So we have all these indices. Uh, so our investment universe is, is huge, uh, which also raises the question uh, of, of whether, you know, that is something we actually want. Um, because there's a lot of stuff in our portfolio that the companies that we own shares in uh, do or don't do um, that uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't meet our standards. Um, but not for all of them, we do know. To give you an example, Recently, we had a lot of criticism, understandable criticism, uh, that we had, and, and, and of course, you can imagine the newspaper headlines, that we had, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of investments in Myanmar. Um, well, uh, you know, the, the, the Myanmar regime uh, certainly would not meet the OECD uh, test at the moment. Um, <clears throat> three years ago, four years ago, that was a great investment, you know. That was that was that we were really making an impact, uh, supporting uh, the, the the people in Myanmar to rebuild their country. Um, uh, but uh, um, I'm saying this um, uh, in particular because it's uh, th these were, for instance, you know, um, hotels owned by worldwide hotel chains uh, that do have a hotel in uh, in in Rangoon. Uh, and yes, we, we were invested in those type of companies, but so this, this illustrates that even that uh, OECD standard um, uh, test that we, uh, that we are applying in our portfolio is a difficult one to apply. Uh, so we, we use that as a kind of a minimum. Uh, and in terms of how do we measure that, we use uh, the, the data of a company called Sustainalytics 
which is actually a company that we were one of the founding fathers of, but we were no longer involved, but at the time we were. Uh, we use their data uh, and uh, we also apply their scoring system in terms of uh, the most grave transgressions of the OCD guidelines. And in our case, in, in case of the gravest transgressions, uh, anything, any company that, 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 that transgresses those uh, norms uh, is sold. So well, we, we, we sell our share. Um, and then there is a middle category where uh, we uh, try by uh, giving it some time and engagement to, uh, to make a company uh, better its ways. Uh, and at the end of a certain term, then we will either stay in or go out. Um, so that's how we approach that. Um, that's, of course, on the ESG side. But even if we go through our whole portfolio and if we would do it all perfectly well and we would know everything and we would all do it real time, uh, that would still not mean that our entire portfolio is, is also making an impact. So that's why we've also said that 20% of our portfolio should, should, you know, meet the impact standards, which is actually, um, the, you know, the, the, the OECD minimum standards is, is a minimum, but that's, it's also a start. Um, so that's how I see the connection between those two. Uh, and I, I don't ex see it ex ex exclusively as, as kind of an, uh, evolution. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that we will ever be, you know, 100% invested in impact, uh, depending, of course, on how you, uh, you know, how you would uh, uh, define impact. So, Joanne, I'm actually going to ask you at that point, because we've got some great questions coming through in the Q&A from the, the rest of the participants. Um, and if I butcher names, guys, please do excuse me. But uh, so I actually posed almost exactly that question and asked whether you could please explain how your organization defines impact investment in the context of 20% of the assets moving to impact investment. Um, saying that, you know, it, it seems to them at least um, that, that there's a spectrum and that it's not necessarily um, binary. So if you could maybe expand on that point. Yeah, yeah. But there also, that's one of the reasons I said that I think it's so great, you know, that you're, uh, that you're in this program or have been in this program, because like I, I, I said, there is so much work still to be done. Because indeed, what is impact? How do we measure it? How do we reach it? Um, you know, uh, what, but what, what we've always said is uh, we're just going to try. We're just going to, you know, go that route and and start uh, start doing the work, uh, and and start try and start doing it with as with you know as many other um, institutional investors as we can because we believe that you know it's the the, the sooner we have standards. Uh, the better. Well, as you know, in in the European space, we now have this common taxonomy uh, that will actually help. Uh, you know, in terms of language and in terms of, you know, definitions uh, to, make, to make clear what we mean when we say uh, certain words. Our impact portfolio is, like I said, um, focusing around two main themes. One is uh, people and health and the other is uh, around climate. And um, uh, to give you an example of uh, where we where we felt we, uh, we made impact and not just bought it. Uh, we've, uh, we've recently, uh, with one other investor, um, uh, uh, set up and, and bought out a, uh, a company that provides clean energy generated, um, how do you call it, warmth, uh, uh, to households in, uh, in a particular part of the Netherlands. Uh, and we also have such an investment in a Swedish company in, uh, in, the, uh, in the urban area in Sweden, where we provide, um, uh, you know, clean energy to, to households. Um, those are, uh, that is one example, there are more, but um, one of the other 
let's say hurdles we will have to take is we're a big investor you know we uh, and we uh, like i said we also have a fiduciary duty towards our members which means that we cannot spend you know uh, uh, millions and millions on having thousands and thousands of investment employees locating for us local impact initiatives uh, and monitoring those we have a certain minimum uh, amounts of, that we have to to you know to stick to in order to to actually uh, make that impact but also you know be efficient uh, and be low cost for our members um, so that is uh, that that is a limitation um, it also brings new risks and uh, we haven't really talked about that yet but of course there's also risks involved and as a pension investor um, we are supervised uh, but also we ourselves we have a low risk appetite um, so that's another factor we have to um, to keep in mind we are not venture capitalists in the impact space thank you Joanna. um we do have a specific question one of the things that we discuss quite a bit is the involvement of all stakeholders and one thing that uh, is fascinating about the process that you've gone through is that you've engaged your beneficiaries and you actually have quite a significant amount of uh, approval for your impact plans can you elaborate a little bit about that engagement how it worked and, and some best practices and lessons learned yeah, absolutely. Um, indeed, uh, we try to uh, to um, you know to consult as many of our uh, members as possible. Still, I have to tell you um, that uh, probably, as in most countries, uh, for most people, you know, pensions is a world of its own, is a non-issue for anybody. You know, before you get before you have gray hairs, pensions is not an issue. Uh, and um, um, that means that engaging our members is not that easy. Uh, still, we try and do it, and we are also setting up a program to start doing that now on a regular basis, because we now poll them sometimes on certain topics, but of course it would be even more interesting to be able to poll them and see the trends over time. Um, what we have seen uh, in our most recent poll about uh, uh, sustainable investing, because we have not asked them specifically about impact investing, we've asked them about sustainable investing, um, is uh, uh, whether they feel that that's a topic that's that's important. And in, in, to our to our pleasant surprise, in a very large majority, uh, almost seventy five percent are members said yes that's important we find that very important and even more encouraging was that more than 65 percent of those said that even if this would mean uh, uh, less uh, uh, return uh, on their pension monies they would still uh, think it's important that their monies are invested in a sustainable manner now that's quite uh, remarkable and uh, and it was also quite quite a relief for us because you know imagine what we would have done <laughs> we have been pursuing this path for 10 years now so I you know I it, it, it was a somewhat of a relief too um, we uh, so we there is broad support uh, within our membership uh, we've also of course polled them as to what would their priorities be and when we talk about sustainable investing there's you know, there's uh, there's on the one hand, uh, what would you like us to invest in and what, what impact would be most important for you? And then on the other hand is of course, uh, and that's what comes to mind most for most people is what they don't want us to invest in. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we, we take those opinions into account, but we've not acted on all of us, on all of them uh, or in a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, sometimes for practical reasons, sometimes because we feel the polling is not sufficiently representative and sometimes because it's difficult. To give you an example, clearly we have many healthcare workers. In, uh, uh, in basically, you know, we have healthcare workers, we have uh, childcare workers, 
80% of our members are uh, women and uh, also uh, more than 80% of our members work part-time. Um, so it will not surprise you maybe that uh, for the topics that they um, feel uh, we should you know, focus our impact efforts on, are many, uh, many of those are related to people, healthcare, uh, clean water, uh, you know, uh, accessible healthcare uh, subjects like that. Those were top of the list for them. Um, much lower on the list, and to my mind, surprisingly lower, were climate issues. Um, now, this poll was made a year and a half ago, uh, and I, I would have been very, very interested to see whether, for instance, after this summer, you know, and, and after COVID and after everything that happened in the past year, whether climate would have, you know, gone up the ladder. I suspect so, but we don't know. On what they don't want us to invest in, um, uh, one of the findings that rather surprised us, uh, but shouldn't have surprised us, was that um, not just uh, things related to human health, but also m topics related to animal uh, well-being uh, were very high on the list. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, uh, they would like us to exclude any products that were you know, produced with uh, animal testing. Um, but another that was also very high on the list uh, for them for, uh, to choose to say that we should stop investing was in companies that produce alcohol. Um, now, I'm glad that we didn't do that before the COVID crisis because I'm pretty happy <laughs> we had all those <laughs> alcohol hand gels uh, <laughs> produced for us. Um, but uh, that, that I'm, I'm making a joke out of it now, but that's a real dilemma, you know? So yeah, maybe they don't want us to, uh, to invest in, uh, in uh, you know, in uh, whiskey, um, but you know, what about 0, 0.0 beer producers or, and, and generally these things go together, you know, <laughs> these, these, these companies, uh, you cannot select them based on, uh, on one of the drinks they produce and the ones you like and the ones you don't. So, um, polling is good. It gives us very valuable information. We should definitely get better at it. Um, but interpreting the results and acting on them is not always that easy. That would be my main message. I'm going to again jump in there with a, a question from the audience, Joanne, because Graham actually asked something related, and, and I think kind of touches on what you had mentioned earlier as well, um, and asking specifically around um, direct social impact from a fund level down. So I suppose the first question being, do you think it's possible? and whether you have any examples of existing or aspirational structures that have worked for you in that regard. And I think it ties in nicely, as you say, with you've gotten these very specific examples from your stakeholders of where they'd like to see that money going. But for Graham's question, how can that be, how can that input be used to stir and resource the existing social sector to potentially create new, new products? I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if I, if I understand the question correctly, um, uh, is it in the chat? Um, we, uh, because is, is this toward is this towards social impact? Is is that your? Um, yes. So he's asking specifically, you know, how if you've got race, uh, if you've got these like you've listed from your examples from your stakeholders, very specific social impact changes that you want to see mm -hmm. being driven. How can you actually, you know, from such a high level fund, yeah. direct that into such kind of very defined outcomes? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's another thing that's complicated, and that also leads to a lot of discussion. Um, for instance, uh, you know, we have an infrastructure portfolio. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, some infrastructure may be easy. So wind energy. Um, but other things are not so clear, you know. Uh, do we invest in a tunnel? Um, we did invest in a in a zero CO two uh, built uh, highway, as a matter of fact, in the Netherlands, which was which was a first. Um, but yeah, if you're very strict, you could say, well, you know, wh what do we use cars for? Why why invest in a highway at all? So. Um, 
you, you can take this, of course, uh, very, very far. But I think zooming out on, on another level, let's look at where we come from. You know, um, I was very much inspired over the, the COVID period by a series of podcasts uh, by Mark Carney. Uh, and um, the uh, former um, uh, governor of the uh, of the Bank of England, um, the BBC made a series of four podcasts with with his thoughts on on um, well basically on the economy, uh, where he said that um, the um, uh, the economic thinking uh, has has you know brought us uh, to a situation where, you know, there's a total split between economic capital that has been totally separated from its, its impact into society and where, you know, we've gone from a market economy to, to a market society. So that, was, that has led to us, our type of pension investors, investing in, you know, all kinds of things like, you know, bonds with a negative return. Uh, rather than uh, in, um, you know, social housing that gives quite a decent return that could, could use some investment in order to make it sustainable and affordable uh, and that will give a certain return on equity as well. So um, uh, I personally think that um, uh, it doesn't always need to be that hard. Uh, to find uh, uh, ways in which, you know, our, our kind of money, uh, i.e. Uh, big money uh, uh, investments that can be monitored, that can be managed, that are, you know, that, that are suitable to a type of investor that we are. Um, uh, there, there are certainly ways in which we can, we can reach those goals uh, and make a positive impact. Uh, and on top of that, what I personally think is also very important um, is that it's that a part of our money should also be visible, close to home. You know, uh, many pension investors, and, and for us, the, the, the whole's the same, we've been driving this, uh, you know, portfolio diversification uh, to, to the extreme where, you know, at a certain point we're, you know, we're, we're just blindly investing, you know, all over the world, regardless of, of the regimes, of the, you know, of the impact of, of the desirability of that. Just because financial theory told us that we have to diversify all over the world according to GDP. Um, well, maybe we should start rethinking that. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to jump in and I, I'm actually combining a couple of questions that have come through, but one of the biggest issues that, that we often hear and we've discussed at length in, in our program is the issue of, of pipelines. So you have organizations like yours with large mandates and large pools of money. And on the other hand, we have a lot of innovators and a lot of people trying to make social impact on the ground, but the investment they need is very small in comparison to the investment you're able to give. And yet there's people that are, one example from the audience is like, we can't afford to buy laptops. And yet we're talking about 20% of roughly 50 billion euros. So do you have a thought and opinion how we can bridge that gap? What type of organizations or, or intermediaries or events do we need to see to make sure that the money finds the recipients on a more global scale? Well, I think they do exist. And I think you do see uh, examples. And uh, well, perhaps Jens should, should, should speak to that. Um, but uh, I think we, we do need, I, I also know quite a few examples uh, in, 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 uh, in my surroundings of, you know, smaller fund managers who, um, who guide these uh, these impact initiatives towards um, yeah uh, uh, towards uh, scaling up towards becoming more investable or who would bundle a number of these initiatives in order to you know make them 
uh, more attractive and uh, and and uh, I would I would not say it's not just a matter of attraction it's also a matter of being able to handle it uh, and uh, in that intermediate space I believe is uh, is a lot of room for improvement and and a lot of room for you know professionals who can make that happen um, but I truly believe that that it is possible I mean it has also been done with microfinance. Um, so it should also be possible with microinvestments. Maybe somebody else uh, would like to respond. And Sue, I believe you might want to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I was, uh, I guess, the, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try to keep it brief, but the, the, the main thing that I want to say is like, impact investment uh, or investment in itself is is not the only answer to the wide range of political, societal, and more mental problems that we are facing as a global community. So I think it's important to recognize that we are part, different parts, smaller and bigger parts of solutions, but there's always space for other types of interventions and partnerships. And I think we should obviously, my personal focus is on, you know, investing for financial return. But I still believe that there are certain instances or models where philanthropic capital has still, is still important and that should not be dismissed uh, right from the get-go just because, you know, the, the problems we're facing are very deep, they go very deep. And I think, you know, investing for return is not the only answer to those. Yeah, I just, yes, yeah, sorry, very, very quickly, very quickly, Vivian, sorry. It's just, I, I also wanted to add what uh, Hansu said, that sometimes we have to think of what are the roles of each of the agents in this impact investment market. So, and, and sometimes like a pension firm is not going to do the same as the venture capital. So the access to the portfolio and assets and companies is going to be different. But what Johan said at the, at the beginning, that, uh, this huge amount of money uh, targeting to impact investment is super important for the for the, the impact investment world. So um, I think this is a very important role of pension funds. So it's it's really important to to have this from um, you, Johan, that this is clear for you in in, in your strategy. The signaling has almost as weight as the capital itself, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. But I, I think that's, that's also what I should point out. There's also risks involved, huh? um, because we are not the only one. Uh, you see a big shift, uh, you know, also the really, really big ones, you know, the, the humongous ones, the, the Black Rocks, etc. They're all shifting towards impact and SDG investment. Uh, so there's bound to be bubbles. Um, asset bubbles, there's bound to be greenwashing, uh, there's bound to be failures, <laughs> uh, fraud. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, we, we, will, we will still have to find a good balance between, um, you know, uh, um, all the you know all the business decisions that we uh, and and the, and the and the, the you know the decision making framework and the risk management framework that we use uh, for any investment and any decision they will all still apply and I, I think we should be aware of that because uh, you see an enormous rush towards uh, green projects towards sustainable projects towards impact projects and. Um, yeah, you know, uh, inevitably, um, some people are going to get, uh, you know, <laughs> a blue eye. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Joanna, you want to leave us, uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. Any uh, final thoughts? Any, would you like to challenge our community? Um, pose some questions that we all take with us as we move forward and, and try to further the field. Well, I think there are two main things. I think this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this, this dilemma between um, buying impact and making impact is something to really keep in mind. 
Um, and that is tied to, uh, to I think, uh, you know, the million dollar question. That is how do you measure impact? What is real impact? How do we measure it? Are we really working towards, you know, the SDG goals? Are we really contributing or are we just, you know, paying lip service? And that will for a very long time remain uh, a, a very hard nut to crack. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for everything, Carbia, to you. Yeah, thank you also to all of you who attended. I, we had so many questions and I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to everything. I am making notes seriously as we go. Okay, we have had such an exciting session. So we are really short of time. I hope everybody received my links in the chat um, and that you can either follow me on LinkedIn and some information about our program. I am gonna share screen for a very important event. So please just bear with me one more minute for me to share. It will be self-explanatory. I have put the link um, into the chat box. So hopefully you have received that. But firstly, I wanted to thank the team behind the scenes who made this event happen. Uh, so thank you to Laura. We've got Darius in the background as well. To the alums that brought us here today, um, it, it certainly does reinforce the power of community and it reinforces what our social impact programs can do, not only from an academic perspective, but from a community perspective as well. Um, so I wanted to highlight this up on the screen now. If you'd like to register to also um, attend that, that has got to do in the lead up to COP26. I'm sure you'd all be interested. But thank you, Juliana, Richard, Camille, all, I don't want to forget your names, Joanna, thank you so much for your time. This has been fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Goodbye.